moment. We'll start in about 10 to 12 minutes. Thank you again. Uh, please just bear with us for about 10, 15 minutes and we'll be started. Thank you. And, uh, as it's traditionally said, a very warm welcome. But more than that, I'd like to say I'm very excited to see all of you here. Uh, I have to apologize to people for the delayed start, especially people who came in early. I sincerely appreciate people coming on time. I don't understand what five minutes left. You know, let me introduce myself. I'm Hoshi Gaswala. Uh, I head up the media business at Cyber Media as the CEO and editor-in-chief. Uh, you know, I, I'm seeing a lot of sober faces here. Normally when I introduce myself as Hoshi Gaswala in the place I live now, people wonder whether it's the start of a comedy act or a stand-up comedy act because Gaswala is not a name that's kind of heard there. So, uh, I head up this uh, business at Cyber Media. Uh, the media business, editorially as well as business-wise. Uh, we are here today, you know, thanks to Sifi putting this event together. All of you know about Sifi. Uh, I've known about Sifi for ages, you know, right from the time they acquired India World, uh, or before that. Uh, but Sifi is a much transformed company, a complete end-to-end -end ISV. Does a lot of other things. Uh, I, I've been working with Sifi for a while now. I, I don't work for Sifi, but we do a lot of work for them. And one wonderful thing that I kind of see is uh, the way they have integrated technology into, uh, you know, creating business benefits. And that's what, you know, we, we're going to kind of discuss here today. That at least the SIFI session is going to focus on that. Uh, the objective of this event is basically, you know, there's this huge amount of data explosion. I don't want to use, but I have to say the, the, the used or much abused uh, thing that data is the new currency. Okay, but we're going to discuss on how to handle data, you know, from a business perspective as well as from a technology perspective. Uh, let me run you all through, we're running late, so I'll run you all through the sessions that we have today. We're going to start with our uh, chief guest, Vishal Mehta. Uh, he's going to do the opening address. Uh, we're then going to have a session on Sifi, uh, from Sifi. Then there's going to be a panel that I'm going to be doing. Then we get into a, a, an IBM session. These are around how to use, you know, both the SIFI and IBM set, uh, sessions, uh, big data effectively, and how to handle it. And then we've got our closing <coughs> keynote, Dr. Vipin Kumar of the National Innovation Foundation. Uh, there is a note on your table. Okay, there, there's this. can you put up that slide, please? There, there is this thing on your table which is a Twitter contest that is being run for three days. So you have to follow Sifi, uh, Sifi Corp, okay? And then the person who does the maximum tweets at hash data center at the rate of Sifi Tech over three days, there are gonna be three winners that are gonna win a prize. So you guys can start tweeting now, you can tweet, we're gonna keep you busy over the weekend tweeting, so you'll, you'll, three of you win a prize. So, sorry? Okay, so, you know, you can begin twe tweeting now, but before that, you'll have to follow Sifi Tech on uh, Twitter. How many of you are on Twitter here, by the way? Uh, we don't have a challenge selecting. The, the digital expert is going to select the winner. Okay. Uh, housekeeping, one announcement. Guys, please keep your mobiles on silent. Uh, without any further ado, I'm now going to introduce our uh, keynote speaker uh, and chief guest. Uh, Vishal Mehta, I don't think he needs an introduction. He's a founder at uh, Infibeam. And uh, he, he's from a large business family, but decided to move out on his own. I couldn't think of a speaker better than him. You know, I was talking to him and he said, we have billions of transactions you know, per month. And uh, would like to hand over to Mr. Mehta to come and talk about you know, his journey, you know, how technology has benefited. We're all running short of time, so he also has to leave. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, I've been told to talk for 10, 15 minutes about, you know, the business that I run, as well as some of the things that we actually gain using technology. Um, what I'd like to do, and I think, you know, to many of you, I believe a lot of, uh, Insights have to come in terms of, you know, listen, what is technology doing? How is it going to transform? What is the future going to look like? I think I've actually, um, um, you know, taken a compartmentalized approach in terms of maybe thinking through it uh, because technology is such a wide term uh, and everyone has a mental model of what it means. Uh, some people think of technology as a communication layer. Some people think of technology 
like you know, the software layer. Some people, people think of technology in terms of hardware, uh, some think of uh, technology in terms of data, data analytics, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I think that, you know, in, in terms of, you know, just thinking through, okay, each of these layers, and, and what's happening in each of these layers, and, and, and you know, there's a lot happening, it's incredible. Uh, in terms of you know, the pace at which things are, things are changing, updating, so on and so forth. So what I thought was, um, you know, maybe ten, five, ten years ago, and people were talking about thinking of compartmentalizing technology in terms of, you know, gold rush. Okay, that, you know, listen, there's a lot of money there. So let's actually think of building a technology framework or a technology company. And then, you know, we'll also talk about utilities and how, you know, think, thinking of how technology works in terms of utilities becomes more relevant, important both in the short and long term. But I want to maybe walk you through some you know, live cases that we work with in terms of you know engaging with clients um, and, and, and some of the things that they're thinking about and, and what they're trying to solve using technology and how does that work in terms of business, business models and, and so on and so forth, which gives you some insight. Uh, to give you, uh, you know, just a short, you know, uh, background of, you know, uh, you know my company, we, we started about 10 years ago and uh, we've been in this e-commerce enabling business you know, for the last 10 years. Uh, and what that does is it allows us to work with many clients across many different verticals. Um, so um, the basic premise uh, that we wanted to start out with 10 years ago was um, that can we use something called cloud computing then it's not very common. It's a very household name or word now. Uh, and, and even, you know, I believe that in this room, a lot of people understand what that means. Maybe outside, people don't. They don't. They know the word, but no, it's it's very hard to to understand. You know, the the specifics and so on and so forth. Just like how people think of 4G at the moment. So, um, you know, um, what we do is we provide these frameworks, and, and I want to walk you through like you know some interesting things that we observe. You know, which is going on. We provide our digital enabling services to clients and merchants and many others in India as well as overseas. That's the technology part of our business and then we also have a supply chain part of our business that I think I'd cover some other time. Um, but, um, you know, to walk you through some examples, um, you know, there's a client who we work with uh, and they're based in, um, you know, the Middle East. And, um, you know, how many people have a 4G handset, by the way? You raise your hand? All right, 4G enabled. All right, cool. So, um, you know, the interesting thing is that, you know, I mean, the reason why people especially use 4G handsets is, you know, better data speeds, right? I mean, that's, you know, basically the premise uh, that I can actually, you know, get 100 Mbps or, you know, 1 gig. And, and that's fast. It's quick. You can do so many things. I save time. I can actually watch videos and I can play games, many other things, right? But the interesting thing is that how many people get the network of 4G everywhere? Okay. Um, I mean, that's the interesting part, right? So as a consumer, you know, what you care about is not 4G, you care about speeds, all right? And when you talk about speeds, there, the interesting part is that, you know, I mean, I may not be on a 4G, I'm on a 3G network, and I'm on Airtel, and maybe the signal over here is not coming, but the idea that I was sitting next to me is the signal is actually very powerful. Does that happen to a lot of us? It does, right? All right. So the interesting thing is why? You know, why can't there be like, you know, some kind of a network so that, you know, I can just get the best network out there? Why do I have to think about, you know, hey, listen, you know, I'm subscribed into one particular telco where the network is strong because the same network is not strong outside this room and it's strong inside the room possibly, okay, and vice versa. So as a user, most users will care about, I just want the best network, okay? And, uh, you know, the framework to be thinking about is that is there an Uber out there? You know, a lot, a lot of people over here should be knowing the Uber business model, not own the asset, own the network, okay, or, you know, the user, if you will, the user engagement. But isn't there something whereby you can think about, like, you know, a Uber kind of a framework, where you say that, you know, listen, I don't want to be connected, or I don't want to just think about one particular network, okay, and I don't want to actually sign up with one network, all right, but I want to sign up with somebody who can actually provide me the best network, wherever I'm there. And I want to ride on top of everyone, right? People use the word, and I'm going to, it was, it's very common, I actually learned these words, by the way. I'm not a telco guy, but I, work, I, I know about this word, many of you will, which is called mobile virtual network operator. You heard of that? Yeah, many of you? It's called MVNO. 
So when you think about MVNOs in this world, and then you say that, listen, an MVNO is not owning the network. They will work with the network operator to provide you a service. A case in point being Virgin Mobile. Okay, They don't own the network, but they will provide you a service because they don't, as a user, you don't care who the backend provider is. You know Virgin okay, as a network. So there's this concept called mobile virtual network operator. The unfortunate part in that framework is that the mobile virtual network operator only works with one operator. Okay, they actually sign up at the back end with perhaps one operator, whoever that operator is, and then they use that network. All right. But why isn't it possible that you know one particular MVNO can use multiple operators at the back end? Correct? So that I can actually go and pipe and I can figure out what is the best network for that user, whoever that user is of mine. And I can work across different networks, which means that I'm sitting on top of one network, I can sit on top of five networks. And then I can go and figure out that, hey, listen, does that make more sense or does that not, not, you know, make so much sense? But guess what? It doesn't end there, right? Because now we go back and say, okay, even if I figure out that switching the algorithms, which is the data and the analytics and the setups and the frameworks that would require you to be able to set that kind of a framework in an MVNO so that the user can switch. So, I mean, it's user does not have to manually go and switch but the network switches automatically without you knowing it because all you care about is the network that actually works well the next phase starts which is that for the user you know is there a sim card that will work across all right like something which is like a universal sim card all right which is actually and by the way i'll tell you that you know apple now supports it and android also supports it i'll tell you that's a reality okay i can switch between operators <laughs> And, and in fact, which means that it's just the SIM card, the operating system, the software has to support it, right? To be able to go back and drive that framework so that, you know, people manually don't have to switch it. Okay, so the SIM card works across all. So now we've gone from a communication layer to a hardware layer to a user. And then you say that, okay, now I know I have a universal SIM card that will switch an MVNO, which can algorithmically figure out what is the best network, wherever the user is, so that the user is not signed up with one network and you don't need portability. What is the whole point of portability? Maybe cost or whatever it may be, right? Then there's another layer, which if you go back and say, okay, you know, how does the, the hardware figure out what is the best network? Because it's hardware dependent, right? You know, some people have 4G, some people don't have 4G. Then we have 3G, right? So am I able to figure out the RF signal on the phone? Okay, and are you able to go and figure out that what is the best RF signal? Does it work or does it not work across? Okay, which becomes even more interesting. Because then you need to have some kind of an application or some software that goes and figures out that based on my handset, what is the best RF signal for the network that I want to operate. And so as a result, completely idiot proof. You don't have to think about whether it is 4G, 3G, 2G, whatever it may be. All right. And it actually works. And that will be like an Uber, you know, of a telco network, which is kind of cool. All right. Having said that, um, maybe the answer is WhatsApp. You don't know, right? Because WhatsApp, I can do phones. I don't care about what network. Basically, I use it for my data calls, whatever you call it, right? So I think that you know this is very interesting because what I'm trying to get to is it's sort of one layer, okay? Technology is like multiple layers which are coming together to be able to go and drive a business, a preposition, uh, a better experience for a user and the user engagement as well. And then between those layers, there's a business model that has to emerge which actually supports the underlying behavior of all these different changes that happen across different layers of technology which becomes exciting because then you go back and think about it and say, do you want to be asset light? Do you want to be asset heavy? Do you not want to own the network? Do you want to own the network as asset? Do you want user engagement? Do you not want user engagement? Do you want to collect data? How will you use that data to be able to go back and make it better, smarter, richer every day? Is there a way to use intelligence? Is there a way? I will tell you, I promise you about 10, about, I actually graduated about 15 years ago, right? Actually, it's 17 years. And 17 years ago, my first thesis was on neural networks, right? It was artificial intelligence. It's like mixed and neural programs to figure out what, you know, how do you essentially make it smarter, better, what do you call it, regressions, okay? This is 17 years ago. And even today, people talk about artificial intelligence. And it's becoming smarter, it's becoming more easily, you know, the things that took a long time doesn't take so much, okay? And computing's become faster, right? So in other words, you can use neural networks to predict weather, okay? It's even better, it's interesting. Right? Or I can essentially use neural networks to go and figure out, you know, um, maybe, um, uh, you know, uh, secondary opinion for air traffic controllers to be able to go and figure out, you know, what is the operation distance, operation velocities, and how does it work, and how does it come together, and 
does it make sense so that I can alert that traffic controller about a near collision situation, which is even smarter, right? Or I can go and figure out that, you know, listen, earlier memograms were 2D, right? Now you can have 3D memograms, it's even better. There's more data, richer information. And so as a result, I want to actually go and figure out, using that data, what is microcalcification? calcification, what's the property of cancer, because you can't solve, you know, cancer. you can cure cancer, but you can only detect it, you can cure it. And so I want early detection, and so maybe a radiologist doesn't miss it, but can I use that 3D memogram, can I use all that data, and can I actually assimilate something, and can I figure out through artificial intelligence what is going to be microcalcification, what is cancer, and how does it actually progress, and here listen, there's an early detection system, which is even smarter, right? And people talk about internet of things, and people talk about intelligence into homes, and people talk about intelligence everywhere, and it is some kind of a neural network behind it that does the job. So I think the theories have not changed. I think the underlying frameworks of computing, software, you know, you know the, the ability to not have to recreate things, I can build up on top of existing things, right? And I can do it faster and better, gives them momentum. And that momentum actually gives a lot of opportunities for business to actually expand, become larger, richer. And that's the exciting thing for everyone out here, in my opinion. And I think, you know, my excitement, of course, you know, when I started my, you know, journey, um, it started with the fact that, hey, listen, can I actually offer affordable computing, and affordable shops, and, you know, this whole concept of shops, and so on and so forth, that kind of becomes narrow when you actually, actually live into it and say, you know, hey, listen, my concept and definition of what a shop is actually changes. Okay? I don't need to actually just think about giving a software or a framework, or so on and so forth. Let me give you surrounding value-added services, because that's what you require. Let me actually work on solving a problem. So. To my point, this case of what I talked about in terms of telcos and so on and so forth, this innovation is happening globally. It's happening in parts of the world that we don't know of, that we are not aware of. We've actually given the framework to someone who actually wants to do something similar. I think this common, this is this information that I'm talking about is not uh, uncommon. Maybe some of you may have heard of some, you know, specifics and so on and so forth. Not many people adapt and try it out. I give another example, and I think that that's also very interesting. Um, in e-commerce, everyone knows e-commerce, right? And the uh, mental model there is very similar. And a lot of people actually ask me, how do you make money in e-commerce? Don't ask me that question. I will tell you, we know, but uh, it's very interesting, actually. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer. So um, in e-commerce, the most interesting thing that happens is that, um, you know, this is my theory back in the day, about 15, 20 years ago, that someone will go back and say, let me actually go and spend you know a few hundred million dollars you know and acquire as many customers as i want because if i want to think about a business which is 20 25 years you know you can't build a retail business and make it profitable in two years right i mean you have to think at least 10 years you know, people and that's one of those things right you know you have to think slightly long term so the objective there was that you have to think about building a long-term sustainable business and rather than spending you know I mean, if you're going to spend 50 rupees uh, just hypothetically speaking in a period of 10 years then typically most people do is they spend 5 or 10 rupees every year for 10 years and go and figure out how to acquire and become profitable there's a different way to think about it listen let me spend 50 years and 50 rupees in two years and then figure out how to become profitable for the remainder rate not a bad idea okay i mentally amortize the cost of whatever i do over a period of 10 years while i spend in two years Okay, nothing wrong in that. It's very cool. And it worked. It worked beautifully because nobody thought about it. It's very simple. I was doing the same thing, but I'm going back and saying that I have a different philosophy and I'm going to go back and think about amortizing the cost. Perfect. The problem starts when everyone starts doing the same thing. Which means that now the amortization of 50 becomes 500. Unless you have 500, it's of 50. And you go and think about it, then there's an arbitrage. 500 over 10 years and so on and so forth, right? So you have to completely... Things have changed, I will tell you, the generation gap that I talk about, I've talked about two kids, one is six and second is nine, I have a generation gap between the two. I used to talk about generation gaps between kids, which are like 15 years apart, now it's three years, right? I'll give you one more example before I stop. Um, FinTech, finance and technology. Uh, we are one of the largest shareholders in a company called CC Avenue. CC Avenue is a payment, um, you know, gateway company. Uh, they provide payment processing to some of the Merchants in India, they are one of the largest payment processors in the country. They are also clients to SIFI. Okay. So in that, the interesting part is that, um, you know, I will tell you, the financial systems in India for businesses very hard to get a loan. I can promise you that. Which is, if you want to go get a loan, you have to apply 105 pages 
of paperwork to be able to go back and get a loan. All right, and you need to need to have a collateral. Without which you can't. It's very hard. And I'm not saying you can't. It's very very hard. And a small business who is out there, we realize that you know, listen, people want to sell, but they don't have money. What is the the? I realize, and I know it's true. People just don't realize it. The thing which is in scarcity in this entire country is money for any business. So the guy who wants like five is iPhone seven, which is launching, okay, very shortly. And I'm like a um, you know small shop, mobile shop, and I'm selling mobile phones, and I know it is going to be short supply. I know I can make money, okay, very easy. I want ten lakh rupees. Where will you get ten lakh rupees? Do you think he can give his balance sheet, income statement, and so on and so forth to a bank and say, "I want ten lakh rupees"? Do you think they'll give them? Very hard, no. No. He knows he's a trader. He knows he can make money, so he has to borrow from somebody. And when he borrows from somebody, then he goes back and says, "Okay, you know what? I will give you three percent interest a month," right? because he knows that ten lakh rupees will give him a lakh rupee advantage, and he does not mind paying that interest. And the interesting part is that there's this whole opportunity which is open because, okay, yes, you were SIFI or NFIB, maybe cyber media, okay, you get loan, but other people don't get loans. And he has a business proposition and he knows or she knows that I can actually make money out of this. And then there's this whole thing in a bank which is called like a credit rating manager. I just don't even know the concept of what that means, by the way, because can you use data? I, I do have a credit rating manager, correct? You know, why can't credit be like, you know, figure out, okay, I know. Give me your okay. By the way, I think the bank statement is real in India. I, I think that you know I would think that you know balance sheet income statement fine. But bank statements are always real. <laughs> so you know what is the money that is come in, what is money that is come out. Can I actually go back and take call on you and say that you know you do hundred rupees of business, I can lend you five rupees. I don't have a problem. I will not lend you hundred. And through that, you can actually go and figure out if you're an NBFC. I know there's somebody who gave me a card from an NBFC world. That you know, listen. There's an opportunity that I can actually open up, and I can, you know, make it a win-win situation, where I know that you know I want to give a loan only for a period of three months. I don't want to do it for one year, and I can actually make money, because in three months I will know what the NPA is, and I will know whether it is actually going to work or not, and the the cost of borrowing may be ten, twelve percent, and I can, you know, perhaps lend it. There is lots of interesting models, very, very interesting world, and we see a lot of that given that we provide the frameworks to many of these companies to just innovate on top of us because we believe that I think you know it's not possible to experiment they reduce the cost of experiment but it actually becomes a business for us all right then I'll stop my presentation over here thank you for having me and I look forward to meeting some of you thank you are there any questions okay I think there are no questions uh, May I request, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Mehta to just come back on stage for a second, and Arvind Saxena, who's the CMO of uh, SIFI, to give him a small token of our appreciation. I'm sure you might be selling these on your website. <laughs> thank you. You know, I, I have to thank you for agreeing. I couldn't think of a, for coming and doing this of a better speaker. And my apologies. I know you have another uh, meeting to catch, so my apologies for the delay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shikhar. I'm going to be here for a bit, so. Folks, our next session is around the theme of uh, this event, which is transformation through next generation data centers. And we've got a specialist from SIFI, okay, uh, Hirak Mukherjee, who I was talking to me, he, he's done 15 years in IBM too, and he's been at SIFI. Uh, you know, if I could speak as well as him about next generation data centers, I think I'd be working for SIFI and doing this session. Uh, no, but I you know, actually, we, we are in the business as well, also giving Gyan. So I'm going to hand over to Hira, can let him kind of take over from here, Hira, over to you. And just to uh, take a cue from uh, what uh, Mr. Mehta was saying, that uh, it's not just difficult to get loans uh, in India, these days, uh, banks have started a very interesting thing, which I just heard. They've, uh, with, with businesses which has a fairly large uh, exposure, uh, they've started taking the passport of the promoter. And uh, that's a safe key. It's not a part of the uh, debt recovery tribunal uh, norms, 
but they have just started taking it uh, in safe custody just in case uh, you don't decide one night that uh, India was not a pleasant place any longer. Right, so... Uh,
and do a quick calculation and fairly accurately predict the, the propensity for cardiac diseases, stroke, paralytic strokes, dementia. It's a small little device, doesn't cost much, connects to either the USB port or the micro USB port of your smartphones. There is a small little device which is available today which can actually measure 50 different vital parameters of the body without going to a healthcare professional, without going to a doctor, without going to a hospital and can actually transmit it uh, digitally to the healthcare professionals. Uh, the uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Applied Physics Lab in the US, what they've done is uh, they've been able to put uh, robotic arms on a double shoulder amputee and get him to control the arms with his thought. Thought. There's no external uh, stimulant. Uh, I know Ahmedabad is fairly big in the pharmaceutical area and uh, look at how the entire distribution side of the pharmaceutical industry is getting impacted. A couple of weeks back in Bombay, that's where I live and work out of, uh, I met a couple of uh, startup companies and these two companies are in the distribution side of pharma, medicine distribution. And uh, they've come together, they've merged. What is very interesting is both these companies have got funded and together they're sitting on 1200 crores of capital. 1200 crores. And they are trying to figure out how uh, they can completely change the entire distribution side of, uh, of uh, pharma distribution using technology. So they're basically shopping with a bulk of the money. There's so much money that uh, half the time they don't know what to do with it. But the other half, uh, they're actually trying to uh, scout for interesting tech companies which will kind of uh, uh, you know, impact uh, what they're trying to do. Retail, uh, most of you know what's happening, uh, what's happening in, the, in the retail uh, domain <coughs> and logistics. Uh, there's a very interesting video which, uh, uh, from Sifi which I actually love, which is the story of uh, the India Post. And uh, you know, a few years back, India Post uh, came out with a requirement to connect all their, uh, all their uh, post offices. And they have about 28,000 uh, post offices around the world. See, if we did that project, it was a massive project. It connected 28,000 post offices with 60,000 links, etc., etc. So technically, that was a great project, great things. But what what happened was, and this is interesting because India Post is a government uh, department. India Post started on a journey of transformation from being a pure post operator. They said that we will, they said that we will move to uh, to, to logistics, okay? They said that <coughs> we will move to banking. And now they're saying that, you know, if, if we reach 28,000 locations in the country, both urban, semi-urban and rural, if we have uh, banking and payment happening, if we have logistics happening, what stops us from becoming the country's largest retail company? So, that friendly neighborhood postman, from that onwards to a retail and maybe a retail e-com player, a government undertaking. It's an amazing story of transformation simply based on uh, what they acquired through, through a network. Uh, some of the industries are, 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 are very real and people talk about this pure digital business which is, which is kind of uh, strange and bizarre, it cannot happen like manufacturing. No matter what you need to manufacture, it's, 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 it's not virtual, it's real. But uh, it also has uh, some connotation around it uh, which, which can impact. And I don't know how many of you have heard. Uh, very recently there was an incident which happened in Calcutta in a restaurant. Has anybody read that uh, on Facebook or something? Yes, you have. So there was this lady who walked into this restaurant in the Park Street area of Calcutta with uh, her chauffeur and the restaurant did not allow her to come in primarily because they, they felt that the chauffeur was not dressed adequately enough for the restaurant and she wrote this and was on the 
on, on, on digital media and it went viral, etc., etc. Uh, you may may know that I am from originally from that city, and I have been to that restaurant. There's nothing virtual about it. It's a real restaurant and with really good food. I've eaten there many times. Uh, the only problem was that uh, they never could imagine that uh, being a physical entity with absolutely no virtual presence, they're probably a trending brand now. Maybe for the wrong reasons, but a trending brand. And that's one aspect of digital business and digital transformation which, uh, which a lot of customers are worried about. Now, a lot of these transformations, these discussions are happening in different boardrooms. <coughs> I know some of these discussions are probably happening in some of your boardrooms. Uh, in many parts of the world, some of these discussions, uh, uh, the technology folks are, are actually present in those discussions. Very interestingly, in some of those cases, the technology people actually initiate those discussions. We are a bit further away from that in India, but uh, that's what's happening around the world with your colleagues. So what is the digital ecosystem like if this starts working? When it works, it works in such a big It is a digital unit, and either I'm too old for digital technology or this is too young. So anyway, I'm not going to experiment with it too much. So there are two, three things which is happening. The consumer, the enterprise, and the service provider should come up here. That's it. Now, one thing which is happening, and it happened a few years back uh, with the financial services industry, where uh, this intermediation Happen. You aware of this term disintermediation? Okay, some of you are. This the top part is an example of disintermediation where enterprises and consumers are directly dealing with each other. Now, yes, of course, in a retail environment it happens, in a, in a bank and financial institution, it is happening now, earlier it never used to. Uh, but in core enterprises, for example, pharmaceutical companies, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And uh, pharmaceutical companies, their classical business model of MedRep-driven uh, business model is now coming under a lot of threat, primarily because of this new generation of uh, well-funded startups, which are trying to dismantle that uh, entire. So this is a very interesting phenomenon which is happening, which is this intermediation between the enterprise <coughs> and the consumer. <coughs> so if all this is happening, then what's, what's our play in city? What, what do we do? And uh, there are quite a few interesting, exciting, busy charts. But let me first summarize it for you so that you, know, you, can, you can follow it very easy. There are broadly four things which City does as a company. Four things. Firstly, it provides cloud infrastructure through data centers that we have. Uh, we've got about six data centers around the, around the country. The seventh one is coming up. There's a large cloud uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, different flavors of cloud. Private cloud, public cloud, hybrid cloud, all combinations and permutations. But firstly, cloud infrastructure. Second, a network. And <coughs> it's now the country's largest MPLS network, but this network is now evolving into the new stage. And there is one chart on that, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and show you that. And it's called the SmackNet, primarily because of uh, this new type of business which is happening, the new type of digital data which is happening. Normal, usual, traditional networks are not very good for that because everything is now becoming as per consumption. Okay. You're consuming digital data and therefore even the network should probably be on a consumption model which the current networks do not allow. So the next generation network which uh, CP is trying to build called the SmackNet will be in, a, in, in such a manner that uh, you, know, you can actually, actually consume 
certain amount of data, and therefore uh, the commercial models uh, will also change. So that's the second thing, cloud, the network. The third thing which it does is it puts things together for it to work. Puts things together. In, in the technology industry, we call this system <coughs> integration. Basically, getting a lot of things together and putting stuff together. So, so if you were to go and buy uh, some stuff and kit from IBM, and uh, maybe networking from Cisco or somebody else, we can take all this, put together, and make it work for you. So that's the number, third thing we do. And finally, the fourth thing that we do is we can run and manage all this field. So once you've got this, it's up and running, we run it, we manage it for you so that you don't have to worry about the operational aspects of running technology. So these are the four things. Cloud, the network, we put things together for you, and we run and manage. Simply put. Underline, this is how it is. So different uh, flavors of cloud, which goes to serve this philosophy. And this is the kind of trends that we are seeing. And these are some of the challenges that we are seeing. Uh, I had uh, the privilege of a sneak preview of uh, IBM's uh, presentation. So they'll probably talk a lot about SAP and HANA, etc. We see a lot of movement happening in the virtualization space for HANA. Uh, we started this practice in about a year and a half back. In about 18 months, we got more than 30 clients nationally. Uh, and you may think that it's a very modest number. Yes, it is. But for us, uh, 30 clients on, uh, on a virtualized HANA environment, which basically runs a client's lifeline, is not too modest, honestly. So we've, we've seen that happening. Now, uh, we've also started seeing selective adaptation of uh, open source. Earlier open source was uh, kind of a bad word, but uh, now yeah, we've seen selective adaptation happening. Uh, one of the things which we see is that this cloud and, and the combination of uh, you know private, public, hybrid, all of this stuff is impacting the, uh, the uh, buying patterns because the, the, the way you structure the commerce part of it or, 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 the, or the contract is completely changing. It's not fixed fees anymore. It's purely based on consumption. And uh, very interestingly, uh, we see a lot of uh, public sector companies actually taking advantage of it. And I'll probably at the end just leave you with one such example. <coughs> so this is basically what I talked about. Uh, the entire, entire uh, orchestra of what we do is broadly in those four areas. And underneath those, there are, there are different service lines uh, that happens. Uh, I mean, including if you really wanted to buy some hardware from us, maybe an IBM hardware from Cipi, he's very happy to actually do it for you. So those are underlying uh, different service lines and different business lines. But broadly, broadly, those are the four things uh, that we do. Okay. Here's the the new concepts of uh, data centers and cloud centers. And uh, please remember that there, there is, with, with this invent of uh, Internet of Things, <coughs> there's a lot of data which is, uh, which is getting generated in a decentralized format. So if you are a manufacturing company, and you may have your data center centralized either in your own location or our location, or hopefully our location, even then, not a problem. But the data, because of Internet of Things, is getting generated on the shop floor. The data, because of Internet of Things, is getting generated at the sales rep level. It's right in the field, which is further away from the data center. Now, earlier, you would take that data and use nice thick pipes of network from people like us, Sipi. Uh, and, and bring that data in, which we would love because that's a lot of money for us. But now, there is a lot of analytics also happening at the edge, at those points. These are called thin layers of analytics. 
uh, interesting mathematical models and interesting statistical models. And uh, so that can get done there itself. You don't need to bring all of that back into one big uh, monolithic center. Given that scenario, and uh, given what is happening in the public and private cloud environment, this is the new network which is getting designed. It's completely software design, software design network. Primarily because I said those fixed line networks which we have today is not any longer suitable for the new type of things which is happening. Okay? And uh, along with IoT machine learning is redefining a lot of stuff. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, Vishal uh, did talk about uh, some, some, of the, some of the things uh, on machine learning. It's one of the most interesting aspects. I, I, I do a lot of uh, you know, research on that area as well. And, and that's redefining. So to be able to support that, you need newer kind of infrastructure, which is what is coming out uh, now. So that's that's the digital play that that we have. Uh, the cloud centers, the the new new age network, uh, the ability to put things together and work for you, and the ability to run and manage uh, stuff for you. And uh, finally, I'll leave you with uh, a couple of uh, examples. Doesn't want to stay on the chart I wanted to. Sorry? Yeah, as I'm saying that either I'm growing old or this thing just doesn't seem to work. Generation gap. <laughs> well, it's tough to accept standing on a stage that you're getting old, but never mind. So, as I said, that, uh, you know, uh, utilities, and this is. Uh, the power distribution company in Uttar Pradesh, UP Power Company Limited. So uh, they have about 52 lakh uh, consumers, like you are probably the consumers of the local let's report. And uh, they decided uh, to, to get city to run their entire technology and uh, the payment mechanism is per consumption. So the calculation is based on uh, per bill. So every time they send out a bill, uh, they are able to calculate uh, along with us how much money uh, is payable uh, to SIPI as a company and uh, our revenues from them are kind of uh, <coughs> in line with uh, their revenues from their customers and that's possible because of this new new way of doing things. And uh, you know the other other thing that uh, I like to talk about on the, on the healthcare is uh, We've got uh, the entire max uh, chain of, uh, of hospitals and there also uh, the, the mechanism of payment has moved from the fixed fee, uh, fixed cost areas to you know uh, per patient uh, kind of, uh, kind of uh, billing systems. Now this is possible uh, primarily because of this uh, new way of doing things. And uh, we've seen that uh, there's a lot of cost savings available for clients on that as well. But that's honestly besides the point. It's it's uh, it's it's, it's you get it. It's good to have. But what is more important is the new age stuff which is happening is all happening on this kind of environment. So if you are thinking of getting there, then this is something which. Uh, you should kind of seriously take a look at. Uh, can you just press that button to go to the next? Yeah. Uh, so, <coughs> uh, so uh, and as as, uh, as we work with uh, with uh, technology giants like uh, IBM, where they bring in a lot of uh, technology and technology transformation. And uh, the winning proposition is of agility, 
and uh, a lot of services transformation that CIFI brings in and together uh, this is what uh, uh, we are able to do. Again, skip the charts, but uh, let, me, let me just uh, talk about it. So, uh, core technology comes in from, uh, from companies uh, like IBM and we use it in our cloud centers, on our networks, our services capabilities and, uh, and, and, and kind of uh, put all of that together uh, for your use. And uh, this, this partnership is important uh, for us as well. And uh, I know that uh, as a company, they do very interesting work. Uh, and uh, I had the privilege of uh, working with them in the past. And I remember for an Ahmedabad-based client many years back, there's a pharma company, and we took uh, the head of their R&D to uh, one of the labs, which is the computational biology research center in Hawthorne, Connecticut, and they were shown some stuff uh, that was going on. So the point is, uh, uh, the R&D folks there in the pharma company were kind of uh, surprised that a tech company was doing this. What I'm trying to say is that uh, technology companies uh, today are not only fully capable of addressing IT management, which more or less is a passe these days. But they are doing work which is at the cutting edge and uh, <coughs> the idea is for most clients to try and take advantage of that and that's the message that we are we are trying to uh, give to you that look uh, yeah, it, it's it's not just about IT management there is more and beyond that uh, can be achieved uh, together uh, if you are willing to just have uh, a conversation. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for having me and I hope you have a great uh, evening.